My name is Dirk Helbing. I'm professor for computational social science at ATI Zurich. Can artificial intelligence be ethical? That's a question that the World Economic Forum recently asked. And for a good reason, in fact, because IBM Watson is running for president, some people suggested. And we've seen recently that Microsoft chatbot actually turned into a Nazi. So it's not so easy to build ethical artificial intelligence. But that starts from the beginning. Would big data be able to fix the world? People have asked. And in fact, there is a lot of data right now. Within just a minute, 700,000 Google queries are sent and also 500,000 Facebook posts. As we go shopping, as we move around, all of that produces data traces that allows to reconstruct what's happening in the world and understand what's going on. So it's possible now to build new instruments to explore the world and to see what is wrong and where the system is broken and hopefully how to fix it. People like Chris Anderson have even claimed that if we just had enough data, the truth would basically reveal itself without the need of science. The question is, is that really true? Some people suggest that we could now know everything if we just collected enough data about this world and maybe even create a crystal ball that would allow us to see what's going on in the world in any place in real time or even predict what will be happening in the future. People have also suggested that it's now possible to rule like a wise king with all that data so we could basically optimize the world. Would it be possible? Would a benevolent dictator be able to get the world in order? Well, it turns out that even a data-empowered wise king or benevolent dictator would make mistakes. And the reason is the following. If there is a lot of data, then there is a lot of patterns in the data. So imagine you look into the sky and you believe to see patterns over there, but most of those patterns don't actually have a meaning. And so what happens is that there are all sorts of spurious correlations like this one, the amount of chocolate consumption and the number of serial killers seem to be correlated. But in fact, there is no causal relationship. Otherwise, <laughs> it would be very dangerous to live in Switzerland, I can tell. Fortunately, this is all a spurious pattern. It doesn't have a meaning. And it's important to remember that actually statistics is tricky. A lot of research findings are false because of this. And so we need to be careful about what we are actually doing to this society. Here is an example. Police, insurance companies, banks, everyone is trying to distinguish good and bad risks, actually. However, there is this problem. Data clouds will overlap, and so errors will happen. Errors of first kind and of second kind. And that means there will be false alarms and alarms that go, don't go off. We've seen that actually in the case of terror attacks, where basically the suspects were known before, but that was not good enough actually to prevent the terror attacks. On the other hand, there are a lot of suspects on those terror lists, people who would never do anything bad, but somehow are suspicious because the algorithm tells they would be. Here is another example. 23andMe came up with a genetic test. And I would tell you basically what are the diseases you are likely to get or what are the diseases you might die of. Now, this genetic kit was actually taken off the market by the health authority. And why is this? Because if you send your genetic data to some other company, they, they would actually conclude that you would maybe get some other diseases or die of some other diseases. So these tests are not reliable enough. And because of these spurious correlations and the patterns that are not meaningful, in fact, we have recently seen that even people who have serious genetic defects might actually be entirely healthy. So we really need to be more careful about the way we're 
applying big data. You could say, oh, maybe this is uh, just not good enough and uh, maybe artificial intelligence will fix our problems. Well, let's see. So, in fact, uh, computational power is increasing exponentially. It's called Moore's Law. Every 18 months, computational power is doubling. And so people expect that in a couple of years, computers would overtake human beings in their capacity. And in fact, a couple of years ago, we've already seen computers that are better than the best chess players in the world. We know robots that are better workers in many places. Now people build self-driving cars. And also, it seems like uh, IBM Watson, a cognitive computer, can in many cases come up with better diagnosis than many doctors. IBM Watson is also very good at answering questions, at least those questions that have an answer already. And so the question comes up, could society now be run like a giant machine? Well, it seems like if you wanted to do this, we just need to figure out what are the different pieces that make up society and then learn how they behave and how they can be manipulated. And in fact, uh, companies like Google want to reprogram the state. They want to come up with an operating system, not just for smartphones and computers, but for the entire society. Now, what is worrying in this connection is that people like Larry Page say there are a lot of things that we'd like to do, but unfortunately we can't do them because they're illegal. So there are reasons to worry about this. My book, The Automation of Society is Next, is actually addressing these kinds of questions. After the automation of production and the invention of self-driving cars, we'll certainly see an automation of at least parts of society. And in fact, this is going on already for some time. In Chile, in the 70s, people have tried to build a cybernetic society. That means data about production of companies would be sent to a center that processes these data and tells those companies basically how much to produce. So to produce more of this product and to produce less of that product. And actually that worked pretty well. But at that time it was not possible to get control of this unpredictable factor of the human being. Now the idea of the cybernetic society has lived on. In fact it's uh, implemented in countries like Singapore Singapore is considering itself as a social laboratory and it's not exactly known what is going on but some things are known and we see in a number of countries that new kinds of technology, AI technology, is being used to govern people. And how does that work? Well, basically you would use algorithms such as deep learning algorithms in order to figure out what people are doing and why they're doing it and how they can be manipulated based on all the data that has been collected about each and every one of us. And this data can then be used to come up with personalized information. We are living in an attention economic, so you're overloaded with information and that makes it easy to manipulate us because we cannot really spend a lot of time on taking all those decisions. So we're in many cases just doing what's recommended to us. So now with personalized information, there are suggestions that fit our personality so well that we would think this is actually my idea and we would not notice to be manipulated. It's possible, however, to manipulate our emotions, our opinions, our decisions and our behavior. In fact, if you see pictures like these, it seems like you're already remotely controlled to some extent at least. And this kind of technology is also becoming interesting for governments. 
There it's called nudging. And in fact, in combination with all that data about each and every one of us, it's called big nudging, the combination of nudging in big data. So how does that work? Well, behind all of this, there is actually this field of behaviorism. And Skinner, for example, many decades ago came up with those Skinner boxes where he put animals like mice and rats inside and would uh, give them some rewards or punishment, food or electrical discharges to make those animals certain things. This is called conditioning of behavior. And these kind of things are now being done also with humans. In fact, uh, companies like Google or Facebook are doing millions of experiments with us every day to figure out you know, how to make us click certain links and buy certain products and so on. So basically, the Skinner box we are living in is the filter bubble that is created around us. That means a cloud of information that is personalized to fit our personal taste and influence our way of thinking and our behavior. Now, unfortunately, even though that doesn't hurt, it has implications and it has side effects. For example, it becomes more difficult to sink out of the box and to be truly creative and innovative. And for sure, we have to be more innovative in the future, not less, because humanity is confronted with a lot of challenges. Another problem is that actually there is a tendency uh, to produce polarization in our society if we have this filter bubble effect. Uh, so people don't learn anymore to confront themselves with different kinds of uh, opinions. And so that makes our society fall apart in a certain sense. Social cohesion gets lost. And this is actually a serious damage to our society. Well, you might think all of that is quite theoretical, but actually it's not. And in recent weeks and months, People have figured out that all of this is already going on and uh, we are much more controlled by algorithms than we thought. And I recommend you to read a couple of books like uh, those ones over here, The Programmed Man or uh, The Herrschaftsformel or The Smarte Diktatur, for example. Now that raises the question, would we be punished? Well, you remember those animals in the Skinner box uh, had to uh, get sometimes uh, electrical di discharge to not do certain kinds of things or to do certain things. And in fact, it turns out that this nudging is not good enough to make us behave in a healthy or environmental friendly way all the time. So people are thinking about stronger kinds of feedback mechanisms to make us do certain kind of things. And in fact, personalized pricing is just one of those possibilities to condition humans to do certain kind of things. So there is a reward and a punishment over here. It still doesn't hurt very much, but there are even stronger tools such as the citizen score, which is already being tested in China. According to this, every citizen gets plus or more minus points for everything that they do. That means uh, if they click certain links on the internet, this is being evaluated. Is your opinion consistent with the government position or not? That determines whether you get plus or minus points. What you do, what you buy, all of that goes into your citizen score. And finally, that determines what conditions you get for a loan or whether you can get a certain job or not, or travel to certain countries or not. That means uh, this is pretty invasive. This is Big Brother watching you and um, also basically Brave New World uh, combined together. But things are going even further. People are discussing about giving decisions about life and death to artificially intelligent systems. Self-driving cars, for example, 
but you could also extend that in principle to decisions about who would get certain kind of medicine or immunization. And so this really becomes a matter of life and death eventually. And that's why we should be concerned about this. Already, some cities are using predictive policing. That means, basically, before people have done anything bad, they would actually be captured and uh, maybe put uh, into jail. And uh, the amount of time they would have to spend in jail would also depend on an algorithm predicting what they might do in the future. Now, remember this example of the genetic test that had different outcomes depending on which company was doing this test. Same thing over here. So one algorithm might have a good prediction about your future behavior. Another algorithm might have a bad prediction. So that is certainly a future that we should be concerned about, in particular as also the behavior of your friends and your neighbors would influence your citizen score and also your future, whether you would be considered a threat to society or not. So this brings our society to a critical point, to a crossroads, and we need to make up our mind where we want to go as a society in the future. It's now possible to build data-driven societies of different kinds. For example, fascism 2.0, or communism 2.0, or feudalism 2.0. These are just three examples. And we should be worried because some people are saying democracy is an outdated technology. It has increased uh, wealth and prosperity and uh, health and also happiness of billions of people, but now we want to do something new. And in fact, this is already happening. Democracy is under pressure, for example, in Turkey, in Poland and in France. And that's why it's really time to speak up and say what we want to happen in our future. Because we may lose everything we built over hundreds of years, you know, including freedom and democracy and uh, justice and security, in fact, and even our jobs. Well, in terms of security, we need to worry that cybercrime, too, is actually exploding exponentially. It costs already $3 trillion a year. And we've seen that the White House, the Pentagon, the US military have all been hacked, and most companies, too. So we don't seem to have entirely secure systems. And therefore, powerful information communication technology, like a super intelligent system, would most likely be hacked by organized criminals or terrorists or extremists or also be misused by extreme political powers sooner or later. And it could be terribly misused against people. And in fact, uh, worries about security are increasing even more with the Internet of Things. So it's really time to say, stop, let's think twice. Uh, we maybe need to have a new approach. And in particular, I believe that we need to ensure a democratic control of those technologies. We need to ensure scientific views and uh, interdisciplinary points of views on these technologies and how to use them. We need to ensure ethical use and transparency, accountability, and also compensate potential victims. Now, this is really important because some people are promising us paradise on Earth enabled with big data and artificial intelligence. And I certainly think these technologies can be very beneficial for humanity if used in the right way. But have you already learned to use these technologies in the right way? I have some doubts because if you look at this top 10 list of the most livable cities in the world, then interestingly enough, none of the leading IT nations are there. So please show us that you can turn San Francisco, for example, into such a paradise before we try to control the entire world with a super intelligent system. I'm 
certainly happy to support a system that would actually be able to support a population to achieve its goal how to live in the future. Well, why do we need to be careful? Because even though computer power is exponentially increasing, the amount of data is increasing even faster. Within just one year, we produce as much data as in all the years before. That means in the entire history of humanity. This is hard to imagine, really, and what the implications are. But it means, actually, that there's an increasing fraction of data that we'll never be able to process or look at. And uh, that means we need science to decide what is actually the fraction of data that deserves and needs our attention. Now, there's another effect. Uh, we go on networking the world, and that is actually increasing the complexity of our world in a factorial way. That means not even this enormous amount of data can catch up with the pace at which complexity is increasing. And paradoxically, even though we have more data than ever and more processing power than ever, this implies that we would eventually lose the ability to control the system top down. We need a new control paradigm, which is actually distributed control and self-organization. In fact, big nudging and citizen scores are not good at a number of things, uh, mainly things that have to do with interactions among people, such as family, friends, solidarity, or social capital. Culture, for example, financial stability, innovation, or jobs for all. And so the paradigm that we should be aiming at is man-machine symbiosis and collective intelligence. That means bringing together the knowledge and ideas of many people and of artificial intelligent systems to get the most out of it. And in fact, we have started to work on a platform that is aiming to create this possibility. It's called NervousNet. And it will bring the knowledge and ideas and data of many people together. Now, the interesting thing about collective intelligence is that it's not the single best solution that turns out to be the winning solution, but the combination of several solutions outcompetes the best single solution. And that's why diversity has a benefit and uh, it's time to build these platforms that would enable this digital democracy. That means upgrade the democracy of today to make it more efficient and take more good ideas on board. And that requires actually online deliberation platform that would allow people to put their ideas and arguments on the table and then sort those arguments uh, in such a way that uh, we would eventually have different perspectives on a complex problem. And then we could start to integrate those different perspectives in an innovative way by a deliberative process, which often comes up with innovative solutions. And this is really important because the decisions we take have to work for a lot of different people and companies. So it's important that they empower people to do all sorts of things. And that's why it's really important to engage in value pluralism. That means if you just have one perspective on a complex problem, as a benevolent dictator would have, then the complex system would not perform well. In particular, if diversity is reduced, eventually that would actually reduce the performance of the economy and also the functionality of society. And that's why dictatorial totalitarian systems, and that includes also this idea of a benevolent dictator, usually end up in chaos and war sooner or later. And we certainly don't want this to happen. So it's really important that we learn to engage in value pluralism. Artificially intelligent systems will have to learn this. And then we can build this democracy 2.0 oh, 
and a capitalism 2.0 that benefits everyone with all those modern technologies that are now becoming available. I'm talking here about open and participatory systems, something like an information innovation production service ecosystem where everyone can link in like in a giant sharing economy. This is really important that we create benefits for everyone because otherwise we're not going to succeed. But altogether, I should say, I'm optimistic about our future. We'll learn how to use these technologies well, and you're very important to get there. Thank you very much.